All right, so here they are asking us to calculate the pH of a solution containing 0.1 molar bicarbonate ion and 0.2 molar carbonate ion. Okay, so here they're saying you have the K1 for carbonic acid and you have the K2 for carbonate ion. Okay, sorry, bicarbonate ion. And these are the values given to you. Okay, so here I want you to like, uh, take a look at it. You have carbonate ion, which is basically talking about your salt. And then you have the bicarbonate ion, which is basically the conjugate acid. So because of this, what can I say? I can say, I can say that here your salt is to acid concentration is nothing but 2 is to 1. So if it is 2 is to 1, can I talk about a buffer action? Yes or no? Yes, most certainly. Because I need the salt is to acid concentration to be in the range of 10 is to 1 to 1 is to 10. Okay, so as long as it is falling in this ratio, yes, I can talk about buffer action of this solution. So now, basically, we have the formula. The formula for pH is going to be nothing but pK2 plus log of concentration of salt by acid. Correct? What is pK2? pK2 is minus log to the base 10 of 4.8 into 10 to the power of minus 11 plus log, one second, concentration of salt is 2 point, uh, sorry, point 0.1, sorry, sorry, what is the concentration of salt? You have point 0.2 and acid is point 0.1. Okay, cool. Now let's simplify this. You get 2 here. So you have uh, 11 minus log 10 of 4.8 plus log 2. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this 4.8, right? I'm going to write 4.8 as 2 into 2.4, okay? And that means I'm writing log of AB. Log of AB is nothing but log A plus log B, okay? So what you get here is 11 minus log of 2.4 and minus log 2 plus log 2 got cancelled, okay? This got cancelled. So what do you have? You have 11 uh, plus 1 minus log 24. Okay, now I'm approximating 24 to 25 because of which I can write this as 12 minus 2 log 5. Okay, and log 5 is nothing but 0.7. So 12 minus 1.4, which means what? 11 minus 0.4, so that is nothing but 10.7. 6. Okay, so 10.6 is the pH that I'm looking for. The pH of the solution is 10.6 is what I'm proposing and it's here. In option B, I got 10.62, which means option B, 10.62 is going to be the right answer to this question. All right, so here they're saying you have 3.92 grams of a sample of ferrous ammonium sulfate, which is FeSO4.NH4 taken twice SO4.6H2O, also called more salt, in a solution uh, which reacts completely with 50 ml of N by 10 KMnO4 solution. The percentage purity of the sample is going to be what? Okay, great. So there's just one idea we need to use here. That is the number of equivalents of KMnO4 used up is going to be equal to the number of K, uh, equivalents of more salt solution that we have. Simple as that. First, we'll go ahead and we will calculate the number of equivalents of your KMnO4 solution because you have volume, you have normality as well. Okay, so number of equivalents of KMnO4 is going to be what? N1, V1 or N into V. So N is 1 by 10. V is 50 ml. So 10 to the power of minus 3. What do you get? You get uh, 5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 equivalents of KMnO4 was used. Which means what? This is the number of equivalents of more salt also that we have used. Right? Now, we directly, uh, you know, can't go ahead and write, uh, convert 3.92 grams to equivalents. We need to know the N factor. So here, luckily for us, the reaction is very simple. So here you have ferrous ammonium sulfate, right? This is more salt. So here in this entire thing, when the reaction is happening, there is just this ion, just this Fe2 plus ion, which is actually involved in redox. So you get Fe2 plus becomes Fe3 plus. So N factor here becomes one, simple. Okay, so if N factor is one, then I can say that number of moles of more salt will be equal to number of equivalents of more salt. 
and number of equivalence is given to me that is number nothing but number of equivalence of KMnO4 which is 5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 equivalence you have so many equivalence of mole salt okay so now you have number of moles formula you know given mass by molar mass right so this is going to be equal to what this is going to be 5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 so here what you have to find out is this given mass once you find out the given mass okay once you multiply the number of moles and molar mass you will get the given mass now that given mass is you know how much mass of 100 percent pure sample you will need okay and what is given to us you have some impure sample so then you take the ratio of these two samples and you get your percentage purity okay let's do that so what is the given mass i'll denote it by m this is equal to 5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 mole multiplied by molar mass of more salt now this is a very famous number which you will be using for calculations at later stages if you don't know it yet it is 392 gram per mole i agree that this is information that should have been supplied by the question but even if it is not it's okay take a moment calculate you will get the answer okay so this is what we have now what do we do so we write it as 392 into 10 divided by 2 into 10 to the power of minus 3 okay this is the given mass or the required mass in 100 percent pure samples this will be 196 so you have 196 into 10 to the power of minus 2 grams okay so at 100% purity, you would need 196 into 10 to the power of minus 2 or we'll write it as 1.96 grams of more salt sample. So at how much percent purity do you need 3.92 grams of sample? Okay, so from here you'll get the percentage. Simple, right? So we'll do 1.96 into 100 divided by 3.92. Nine. So this will go once, this will go twice, this will go 50 times. So what you have here is a 50% pure sample. I hope you understand that as your percentage purity decreases, the amount or the weight in grams that you need to take of the sample to get the same number of equivalent, that is going to increase. Listen again. As the percentage purity decreases, the weight or the mass of the sample required for the same number of equivalents will increase which is why this is inverse variation not direct variation so we cross multiply like this okay cool great so this is what we have 50 percent pure sample that is suggested in option a so option a 50 percent is going to be the right answer to this question all right so take a look at this question here they're saying that in the context uh, with the industrial preparation of hydrogen from water gas, which of the following is the correct statement, okay? And you have A, B, C, and D, you have four different statements. But before we actually dive into the statements, we need to understand the process that is what they're talking about here is the preparation of hydrogen gas industrially from water gas, right? So let's take a look at that part of it. So what's happening here is you have started with water gas, right? So you have uh carbon monoxide plus h2 right this is what you have now basically what we do is we treat this with an oxidizing catalyst right we treat it with an oxidizing catalyst like fe2o3 plus cr2o3 okay so you have an oxidizing catalyst and you have heat okay so here what happens is the product you get is co2 plus h2 all right so this is the product you get so here if you balance it you will see that a lot of hydrogen gas is released and now what is done after this is so uh this mixture this mixture is uh compressed to 30 atmosphere pressure after that what happens since we know that carbon dioxide is soluble in water this carbon dioxide goes into water okay uh, case in point uh, like for example you can see your carbonated drinks that is also where carbon dioxide is dissolved into water okay so that happens and then h2 which does not dissolve is collected on top of water and from there what you get is industrial grade hydrogen okay so this is basically the industrial method of preparation of hydrogen so now how exactly so what happened here this h2 that we got right so how do you purify the h2 you scrub it 
right? Um, so basically, H2 is obtained by scrubbing the entire product mixture, not H2. This entire product mixture is scrubbed with sodium arsenide. It is scrubbed with sodium arsenide. All right. Yes, it is scrubbed with sodium arsenide and uh, carbonate is taken into the mixture and hydrogen is out of the mixture. Okay, so that is how you get pure product, right? Okay, cool. So, yes, that was the theory behind this question. Now, let's go back to the options. Okay, so, all right. So, we have our four options here. Option A is saying carbon monoxide and H2 are fractionally separated using the differences in their densities. That is not correct. Fractional distillation is not the way to go here. So, be careful. Do not mark this just because it sounds familiar. Don't do this. Then you have option B. Carbon monoxide is removed by absorption in aqueous CO2-Cl2 solution. That is also not correct. Option C. H2 is removed through occlusion with palladium. Okay, so we've heard H2, we've heard occlusion and we've heard palladium. Okay, we've heard these three things together in one sentence, but it is not the same thing here. Okay, it is something I know you've studied in your organic chemistry, but this is not the same process. Do not mark this. Option D is saying carbon monoxide is oxygen oxidized to carbon dioxide with steam in the presence of a catalyst followed by absorption of carbon dioxide in alkali. So yes, so you absorb carbon dioxide. Basically, we scrub it with a sodium arsenide solution. So yes, this is the correct statement, which means option D is going to be the right answer to this question. Okay, so here they're saying which among the following compounds is the strongest acid, right? Your options are CHI3, CHCl3, CHBr3, and option D, CHCN taken thrice, okay? So, what do we know? We know that if you are talking about the strength of an acid, you can basically say that you can basically talk about this equilibrium. So, acid is going to release a proton plus a conjugate base. Correct. So what we'll do is from each of these structures, from each of these given molecules, we're going to remove one hydrogen. We're going to remove the proton. And then we will look at the conjugate base. We know that if I have to say that your acidic strength of an acid is more, if it is a stronger acid, then I can say that the conjugate base has to be more stable right so i can say that if the acidic strength is increasing then this uh, then the stability of the conjugate base is going to increase right okay good so let's look at it you have iodoform chloroform bromoform so here in these three molecules we have the same idea right what is happening here uh, one second basically you have chx3 correct and so from here what i'm going to do is i'm going to pluck out the proton so i have the proton and then I have CX3 carbon ion. Okay, so here what is happening is that you have a carbon ion on which you have a halogen. Okay, so you have a halogen group attached to a central atom. Okay, your central carbon. Now, what is happening? You know that in halogens, inductive effect is dominating over your mesomeric effect or your resonance effect, which means what? Which means here the minus I characteristic is going to kick in. Great. So when you are talking about halogens we are talking about minus i characteristic great then what do we have we have chcn taken thrice so here you have chcn taken thrice and this will basically give you c negative cn taken thrice so here just you know let's zoom in a little so here what you have is this right you have this and then you have a negative charge on the carbon because of which you can see that here we are talking about the scope for resonance, right? There is resonance possible in this molecule and here you have CN group. You have the cyano group or the nitrile group. So here what is happening is that you have uh, in, in this, again, you have inductive effect and you have mesomeric effect. But here, what is happening is that the mesomeric effect or the resonance effect is going to dominate because of which here you have a minus R effect or a minus M effect. And due to that minus R effect, this uh, conjugate base is going to become more stable as opposed to my CX3 minus ions. Okay, very, very important, right? So this is what happens and because of which this becomes the most 
stable conjugate base. Why? Because we know one very important thing that when it comes to talking about stability, uh, mesomeric effect or resonance is going to be the dominant factor as opposed to inductive effect. Okay, so yes, this is what we know, which means here, because resonance is operating, yes, this is going to be a more stable conjugate base amongst the four options, which means here, CHCN taken thrice, this is going to be our strongest acid, right? So where do we have the right answer? The right answer is going to be option D, CHCN taken thrice. All right, so here they're saying that in the ionic uh, equation for the reaction, iodate plus H plus plus A electrons gives you iodide plus H2O, the value of A is going to be what, right? So here, basically, you have the reaction iodate giving you iodide, okay? You know that in iodate, the oxidation state of iodine is plus 6, and after the reaction, you get iodide where the oxidation state is, sorry, here will be plus 5, not plus 6. This is plus 5 and after the reaction you get minus 1 okay so if you're not you know comfortable with the values even now take a moment pause the video calculate come back and we'll solve it okay so yes i hope that you have it on your tips by now right so this is what is happening iodine is in plus 5 oxidation state after the reaction goes to minus 1 oxidation state so we can clearly see that this is our reduction half reaction that we are talking about right so what is the first step? The first step is to balance the element that is undergoing oxidation and reduction. So here that becomes iodine. So iodine is already balanced, right? There's one iodine atom on the reactant side, one on the product side. After that, we have to balance oxygen atoms. So here you have three oxygen atoms on the reactant side. You will write 3H2O on the product side, okay? And you can see that we are talking about it in acidic medium, right? H plus is available, so we are balancing this in acidic medium. So as soon as you add 3H2O, go ahead and add 6H plus on the reactant side. Now, last step is the charge balance. So you can see that on the reactant side, what do you have? On the reactant side, you have minus 1 plus 6. Minus 1 plus 6 is nothing but plus 5. Okay, and on the product side, you have minus one. And we need to ensure that on both sides, the number of electrons, uh, sorry, the charge is the same. So how will you balance the charge by adding electrons? So here, if you add six electrons on the reactant side, you get what? You get minus one. So now on both the sides, your charge is balanced, correct? So yes, this is your final balanced reaction. It looks like this. You have IO3 minus plus 6H plus plus 6 electrons giving you I minus plus 3H2. This is what you have. In the question, they asked you for A. What is A? A is the stoichiometric coefficient of the number of electrons. So this is 6, right? So A is going to be equal to 6. Okay, this is not very visible. My bad. So A is going to be equal to 6. And 6 is here in option C, which means option C. 6 is going to be the right answer to this question.